Let's uh, open up God's Word. We're going to be uh, looking at the first parable uh, that Jesus began teaching in Matthew chapter 13. Now, if I had time, which cowboys aren't playing today, they're eliminated, so I could probably take a couple hours and you wouldn't mind, right? Uh, we could be and go through all these parables, all seven parables, which are called mysteries of the kingdom, but we don't have time for that. So we're just going to be looking at mainly the first one of the day. Uh, and I want to uh, I want to share with you some background. It's a lot here, so we're going to try to move quickly, but we're going to move carefully. Amen? Let's look, uh, see, what, uh, see what we have for us these days. Now, in many ways, the Bible is a love story to God's children, but it's also a mystery story. There's some truths that have to be revealed to you. There's some things that you cannot pull out of Scripture. It has to be revealed by the Holy Spirit to you. Now, Jesus is a master teacher. And in Matthew chapter 13, he introduces to the multitude uh, seven, uh, seven secrets of the kingdom, or seven mysteries of the kingdom, as he calls it. And they are parables, and we're going to look and see what this first parable is about this morning. But first, let's look at this background. And um, I want to share with you, so starting in verse, verse 1 of 13, and we'll just go in and read. On that day, when Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, such large crowds gathered around him... Uh, that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Now, we've all heard of the popular, uh, most famous uh, sermon ever preached. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Well, this is going to be the Sermon by the Sea. And the crowds gathered around him are so large, probably several thousand in attendance, that he has to pull away and he goes and gets in a boat and pulls off shore. And you can imagine if... Uh, uh, if you're there, he's, probably, he's on the Sea of Galilee, and he's pulled away from the shore, and you can see the mountaintops, and people are just crowded around. It would make like a perfect amphitheater there. And he would sit down in the boat, which is custom, a robotic response. As people were standing and listening, he's seated down, and he's getting ready to speak to them, okay? And then it would get to, that brings us to verse 3. Then he told them many things in parables. The first thing I want us to notice this morning is the method of his teaching, the method of his teaching. Then he told them many things in parables. This is the first thing, first time that it had been mentioned that Jesus came speaking to them in parables. This is the method of his teaching. Before then, he had not spoken parables. Underscore that word parable there and then jump down to verse 10. Then the disciples came up and asked him, why are you speaking to them in parables? Now, what is a parable? A parable is similar to our word parallel. And a parable for our reference today is going to be a heavenly story, our earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A parable is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So that's the method of his teaching. He came teaching in parables. Well, why did he come teaching in parables? He came to reveal the mystery of his teaching. Secondly, the mystery of his teaching. Let's continue on and read there in verse, uh, uh, back up to uh, uh, the beginning there in verse 3. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower, uh, sorry, down to verse 11. He answered and said, Because the secret of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, to know, but it has not been given to them. For whosoever has, more will be given to him, and, who, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So the mystery of his teaching is this. He came to reveal to them some secrets. There are some hidden truths in Scripture that cannot be revealed to you unless the Holy Spirit reveal it to you or the Lord teach you it. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, where you've uh, got your education. You could, uh, you could today be a graduate from Texas A&M. I know there's some graduates here from Texas A&M College Station. Uh, it doesn't matter if you uh, graduated down there at Baylor University. Uh, it doesn't matter if you graduated at the University of Texas, Texas Tech. It doesn't matter where you've graduated from. It could even be across the river over there somewhere. It doesn't matter where you've graduated from. If you hold a Ph.D., if you have uh, a lot of gray matter between your ears, truth cannot be pried, hidden truth cannot be pried out of the Word of God. It has to be revealed to you. Uh, you can look over, uh, uh, 
one page, and uh, Jesus says uh, in verse 34, as he's speaking, uh, continuing to speak in parables, he says in verse 35, so that, when, so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. I will open my mouth in parables. I will declare things kept secret from the foundation of the world. So there are certain things that have to be revealed to you. So he came not only, one, to reveal truth to them, but also to conceal truth. The mystery of his teaching is that he came teaching in parables to reveal some hidden truth, but also to conceal some truth. Well, so we have the method of his teaching, which is parables. We have the mystery of his teaching, which is Not just to reveal to them some certain things, but also to conceal. See, the group of disciples that were gathered around him that came to him to speak to him and ask him why he was teaching in parables, he explained to them because they had something something certain about them. They had an ability, an inward ability to understand the teachings of the Lord. He said, verse 11, uh, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you to know. But it has not been given to them. So in this group, this multitude that is sitting there, that is, or standing there and listening to him, some people in that multitude, such as the disciples, had an inward ability, there's something special about them, that gave them the ability to understand hidden truth. God had given them the ability to understand hidden things, hidden truth in the word of God. And so they had come to him uh, as he's speaking these parables, He would remind them after every parable, he would use the phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear. Okay? Now, the the parables to them would have been easy to understand as far as the natural story that had been provided. This first parable that we're going to look look at, the parable of the sower, is about a guy that goes and sows a field, sows seeds. And uh, you could talk to them about seed planting, about uh, sowing a field, and the multitude that's there would understand what, what that story is. Uh, it, they would understand the story. But there's a lot of them there that would not understand the hidden meaning to the story. There's more to the story of the parables than what meets the ear. So he came to reveal some hidden truths to them, but to reveal it, but also for some people, he came to make it obscure and to conceal the truth from them. So that verse uh, 14 would be fulfilled. Verse 14 in chapter 13 says, Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, you will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look and never perceive, for this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn back, and I would heal them. So he comes in these parables to speak on these parables to reveal some truth, but to also conceal some truth. Matthew chapter 25, verse 9 says, The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. Let me ask you this morning, what does the word meek mean? The word meek means guidable and teachable. In many ways, these disciples that have come to him after he's shared these parables and asked them these questions, in many ways had something about them that was teachable and guidable. Uh, And so, uh, this morning, I hope that all of us, as the disciples did, come with a meek heart, come with a teachable heart, And we're able to understand the hidden truth of what he has to share for us in this first parable of the sower. So we have the method of his teaching, which is parables. We have the mystery of his teaching, which is to reveal some things and also to conceal some things. But then also we have the motive of his teaching. The motive of his teaching. What is the motive? Well, let's look. Uh, Verse... Verse 12 in chapter 13 says this. For whoever has, more will be given to him. And we have more than enough. 
But whoever does not have, even that which he has will be taken away. So the motive of his teaching is to give more to those who understand and to take that which those that do not understand, take that which they have and take it away. Um, When it comes to truth, truth is truth. And when we gain truth, just as it is in the material world, so it is in the spiritual world, the rich get richer. Have you ever heard that cliche saying, the rich get richer? My dad, my father, my deceased father always used to say that. Well, here it goes. The richer just go get richer. It's usually sometime around a presidential election and someone didn't win that uh, he didn't agree with. He would just always say, well, the richer go get richer and I'm just going to get poorer and poorer. Well, the same goes in the spiritual world. Those that have certain truths revealed to them, they become richer. And those that do not have spiritual truths revealed to them, they become more spiritually bankrupt. They become poor. Uh, illustrate it like this. Uh, my two sons, Reese and Baylor, which many of, them, many of you know them, recently they've been talking a lot, and they are, you know, they're young. Baylor is six, and Reese is ten, and they've been talking a lot about what they're going to do as they get older. Uh, and it's good to have, have future, be future-minded, right? And so uh, Reese's idea of what he is going to do when he gets older, is to live a simple life. He's going to live in a camper. Uh, he's going to have a farm and grow some crops. Uh, he's going to put some seeds into the ground. And uh, at first, he was talking about vegetable gardening. Then he came to me and said, "Daddy, that that's going to take a lot. That's going to take a lot of time. So I'm going to do fruit trees. I'm going to plant some oranges." I'm like, "Well, you better relocate your your farm. Uh, I'm going to plant some oranges. I'm going to plant some apples. I'm going to plant." Some coconuts. Man, I think he's wanting to live in a tropical island or somewhere with that camper. But no, he's wanting to be a farmer one day. And he'll go there to my grandmother's house. And she's 80. I think she's 86 now. And she's, he'll just sit there and talking her head off about farming. Well, Baylor, he doesn't want to be a farmer. He said he might live with Reese in that camper. And I'll tell you what, I've lived in a camper. You put them two boys live in a camper. It gets pretty small pretty quick. Well, he says that he's going to be a butcher. He's going to raise animals for me, there I do. I got a common day Cain and Abel. Uh, Reese, don't, don't, don't bully your brother. Don't beat him up. Uh, but no, he's going he's gonna to build, be a butcher one day. He's going to have some animals. He's going to uh, process them, sell the meat. Well, I told him, well, you can have good practice. We got two pigs in the backyard growing up. Uh, anyway, they want to do this. They got this, uh, this idea of what they want to do with their future. But I told them, told them very plainly, it's going to take some money. Well, Daddy, that's why you have a job. Uh, and so they got a plan when they turn 16. There's a, if we're still here where we live, there's a dollar, student, dollar general down the road, and they're going to go down there and work part-time, and they're going to get this money to have their garden and have their processing plant. All right? And I told them, you might have to look for an investor. Joe Aguilhart, I'll get with you before you retire. Uh, but say Joe was to give them $50,000 apiece to invest in their business. All right? One as a crop grower and one as a butcher and has a processing plant. Well, Reese, he's looked at all these books. He's done all this studying about, uh, about agriculture, maybe even went to a and M. I I don't know. Anyway, he comes and he's ready to invest in his gardening and his farming. He doesn't marry into it, so he's got to find the land. He's got to do all this. But uh, Joe has a little belief in him, knows him. And he, you know, he's a good guy, so he, he helps him invest. Well, he does the same thing with Baylor and his meat processing idea. Well, Baylor has taken the time growing up, and he, uh, through some Christmas gifts, uh, had get, gotten a calf one day. Anyway, he takes that calf, and later on he uh, gets him another one here and there, and he's, he's invested along the way, has a couple calves, got him a heifer, got him a bull out of his he used some land out on his uh, mother-in-law, out of my mother-in-law's place, because that's what they do, cattle. And he's kind of helping work, take over the family business. So he's got a leg up on him, and he he has the mentality to do it. He's he's continually investing, and he's being successful. But Brees over here, he uh, he just put them seeds into the ground. He forgot to have a greenhouse for the winter time to get those seedlings, you know, ready and started. So the first year, he has nothing to show for it. Um, what do you think Joe's going to do with that money? Is he going to continue to invest in this failed adventure? No, but he sees Baylor over here. He's got these animals, and they are just growing, and he's going to have, a, he's going to have 
some kind of inventory one day. So he takes that investment from Reese and he's going to pour it over here into Baylor. And Baylor's going to have more than what he had to begin with. That's the same thing as it is with the Word of God. For those that had the ability through the Holy Spirit, which are Christ's children, to read and understand, God is going to give more and enlighten more in His children than those who do not understand. The rich, in a sense then, are going to get richer. And so, there's a truth about truth, and there's the truth. If you, don't lo- if you don't use truth, you'll lose it. Look at what he says. But whoever does not have even that what he has will be taken away from him. This is why I speak to them in parables, verse 13, because looking they do not see and hearing they do not listen or understand. You know, truth is meant to be used. When truth is revealed to you, when something about the Lord about his word is revealed to you, you're not supposed to put it in your pocket and say, oh, that's a good thing there. Let me put it in my pocket and save it for a rainy day. Truth isn't supposed to be put away for time when you need it. Truth is to be disappointing. Now, why do I say that? When truth is revealed to us as we're studying God's word and and truth is revealed to us, it's supposed to make us feel miserable. Why? Because when we read God's Word and we study it for what it is and God reveals things to us, it reveals how really bankrupt we are and it should drive us to change. So truth, when it is revealed to us, should make us miserable. It should make us confess. It should make us repentive. It should make us want to change. It's not to be put away and used for a rainy day If you don't use it, ultimately, when it comes to truth, you're going to lose it. You can give me a truth today, and if I don't apply it right now, five, six years from now, I probably will not recall that truth that you shared with me ten years ago if I do not apply it right then. So, Jesus came preaching and teaching in parables his method his mo- in revealing the mystery, well, what is the mystery? Both to reveal and to conceal, but also his motive to give more to them that have, but also to take away uh, those that do not have, take away what they do have. Well, why did he come, first of all, before we get into the sower? We'll be in there in just a second. Why did he come, first of all, preaching in parables? This is the first time. What? Why did he do it? Well, in Matthew chapter 12, if you study chapter 12, people said that he had a demon. That only ones that could cast out demons are of Beelzebub. So they said he had a demon. And remember uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, what he said? Do not cast your pearls before swine. Remember that? He said, do not cast your pearls before swine. And he's not going to cast the pearls of his truth before them that said he was demon-possessed. It was his righteous judgment that he brought upon them to teach in parables. And so the hostility grew. Their, their unbelief grew. And so he's going to come to them and teach in parables so that they can be dumbfounded. And, but those that had an ear for believing and an ear for understanding that sought out truth might be able to learn and understand hidden truths of the kingdom of heaven. So now, that's just background. Now we want to get into this first of our parables. And uh, this is the most familiar parable of all. And it's the parable of the sower. So let's go back up in verse 3 and begin reading about the parable of the sower. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. And it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. 
Other seed fell among thorns, and thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground. It produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty, as it was sown. Let anyone who has an ear listen. So we have here a parable. And there's three parts to this parable. The first part of this parable is the seed. Well, uh, what is the seed? Well, the seed, it's not hard to find what the seed is because he explains it uh, in verse 18. Move down to verse 18. So listen to, uh, listen to the parable of the sower. Um, Anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So the seed, we know, first of all, in that verse 18, that the seed is the word of God. Now, the word of God, in many ways, is described as a seed. Let me, uh, let me share with you uh, uh, some things that the Bible says about, about the Bible being a seed. Uh, just one, just one moment here. Uh, one thing about the Bible being a seed is found in First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-three. It says, "Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but about, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which is liveth and abided, uh, abiding us forever." Now, what are seeds? Have you ever thought about that? Around here, it's common. Uh, my dad had a garden. Uh, you know, I, I, my dad had a garden. He was a farmer. Every year from the time I was knee high, I remember him planting. Um, we had some land out there where the Daisy Dairy is at, out past Chisholm. And we had some land out there, and every year he would uh, put in some seeds. And did you know with a seed no bigger than your uh, nail on your pinky, you can put it in the ground, and it can soak up a vine, and then... From that vine, it can soak up a watermelon. It's, it's really, really unique to think about it. And, you know, around here, it, it, it's common. But he would have a garden every year, and he would plant watermelons. He would plant cantaloupes. He would plant purple hull peas. He would plant squash, tomatoes, green onions, uh, cucumbers. You, you name it, he would plant it. Now, my dad had a certain interest in farming. He liked to plant more than he could ever consume. Uh, but the only part about farming he did not like, he did not like the gathering. You know who he chose to do the gathering? Me. Uh, me and my mother. And so uh, he would take us out there. He would drive that truck with a trailer or the tractor with a trailer behind it. And here I am, five, six, seven years old getting off and picking them cantaloupes and throwing them on the trailer. We ain't talking about a couple boxes to take to the market square. Every day it would be a trailer full. That was my video game playing when I grew up, uh, being in that farm, picking them cantaloupes. So now you know why I ain't a farmer. That was cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, I'd rather do that than doing the other job he had me, which was working in the concrete with him. Uh, but no, he had this field, and he would plant this stuff every year. But the unique thing about the seed, he could, he could sit there and he could plow the field. He could pick out this perfect plot of land and he could plow it. He could irrigate it. He could do all these things. But if he didn't have that seed, it didn't matter. In many ways, the churches spend a lot of times looking for the right plot of land. We seek out to find land that will be conducive to our ability to share or to work with. In many ways, we spend a lot of time irrigating that land. But you know what is missed a lot is the most crucial element, and that's the seed. But you can take that little seed and you can put it in the ground and it'll grow a crop. But without the seed, you can spend all the time you want, all the money, all the investment in the land, in the irrigating, in the planting. But you'll come back without harvest. 
So, what is a seed? A seed is life. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful. The word quick is a word we get, uh, our word zoology. It's from the Greek word zoon. It's where we get the idea of zoology, where we get our word zoo from. That's the word quick. The word active comes from the, is the Greek word energes. And it means to be alive, active. So the word of God is both alive and active. It's, it's real. It's a seed. It's a seed that is to be planted. And so it is this source of life. It is powerful. It is pungent. Um, and any Bible-believing church that goes around and does not preach and sow seeds, they cannot expect for there to be a production, a reproducing. And so you have this seed. It's alive. But what also can we find that we have in this parable? What makes up this parable? Not just the seed, but there's actually also a sower. Someone has to go out and sow these seeds. Well, who's the sower in this? The sower in this one, you've got to be very careful when you're uh, studying parables. You're not to intertwine them. They're all distinctly unique. But I don't think I do Scripture injustice by saying that I believe that this sower in this particular uh, uh, particular parable is Jesus Christ himself. If you look at the next parable, and I said you got to be careful, but I, th I think it's fair. Uh, verse 39 in the next parable, uh, next chapter over, we see, or sorry, verse 37. In this chapter, we see he replied to them and said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Well, the Son of Man is one of the titles that the uh, Bible gives to Jesus, that Jesus gave to himself. And so, the sower is the Son of Man. It's Jesus Christ himself. And he just goes and he is just sowing seeds. He's probably doing it a lot like taking them out of a bag and if you were to be a crop grower in that time. Now, if you go to Israel, uh, a lot of their farming is done on a hillside. And it's got different layers so that irrigation is easy because it'll rain on top of the hill and it'll trickle on, trickle on down. All right? But he's just going, and he's walking along the path, and he's throwing seeds, just throwing them lavishly, throwing them anywhere they will go. And he's just not worried about anything. Some of them are going to go here. Some of them will go there. But the most important thing is that he's throwing the seed. He's sowing the seed. And we're going to find that there's going to be four different types of soils. Some of it's going to fall by the wayside. Some of it's going to fall on rocky soil. Some of it's going to fall where there's weeds. But then some of it's going to fall in good soil. The problem is, we don't spend enough time just sowing seeds. We need to be about sharing the gospel with each and every person that we come in contact with and not worry about the end result. Uh, I think about some times that I've sown into some people's lives. There's a couple that I'd like to share with you. One is, I mean, I, uh, when we went to DePaul this last summer, uh, we're up in the mountain. Uh, shared a testimony on testimony night about it, but I'm going to share with you again. Maybe some of you were not here. We had went up in this mountain and got to this uh, place where and we divided up in groups and uh, it was me and my interpreter, Sonia, and a uh, few others. And we go and we come to this house, this shack. And there's some, uh, some ladies there. They're, uh, by the way that they are dressed and uh, uh, their appearance, I could tell that they were, uh, they were Hindu. Or, uh, anyway, we go up and we share with them. We share the, share the gospel. And uh, these, these four people that are on the uh, front porch of this house, after we get done sharing, my interpreter says to me, well, they, they're, they're not ready to receive Jesus, uh, but they've got uh, friends here that uh, 
that have come up and talked with them, that live down the road, uh, down at the bottom, that have had people share the gospel with them, and they are, they are Christian, and they go to a church here. There's a church here, but they are, they are not ready to receive. And I said, well, let's pray for them, and we prayed for them. Well, when we were walking away, I wrote that off. Well, that opportunity was just a, just an opportunity. It was a wasted opportunity. That nothing came good of that. Well, as we're walking away, a guy that was not even sitting on the front porch but was standing in a distance walks up to us and looks at me intently. Now, I obviously can't communicate with him, so um, I, and Sonia's kind of behind me, so I wait for her to catch up, and this guy keeps on walking. But he would stop every 30, 40 feet and turn around and look at me. So I knew he was wanting me to follow him, but I did not know where, and I was tired. Uh, it was a, we were already up. The only way I could see where we was going was going to be going down. And our car was back there, so I'm thinking to myself, if we go down there, if that's where he's wanting us to go, he might be able to get down there an hour, but it's going to take me a week. Uh, and then to get back, hey, this ain't a good plan. This ain't a good idea. Uh, anyway, I have Sonia go to talk to him and see, see what was going on. Anyway, long story short, this guy had heard... He kind of came up and heard what I was saying, even though he wasn't sitting at the forefront, and I did not know he was even there. He heard what I was saying, and he believed the gospel. So it wasn't a waste of time. And he wants us to go down to the house down below and share the gospel with his family. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, Lord. This guy has received now. He's wanting us to, to go down there. The spirit is willing, but the body is unable. Lord, help, help us in this. And we just we start walking. And we go down a little bit. And we're just going to leave it up to the Lord. Well, we come down half, about a third of the way down the mountain. And praise be to God, someone went and down to the bottom of that mountain already and got those people to come up. And uh, they were in a house. And one of our other missionaries was there sharing the gospel with them. And him and his family all prayed to receive Jesus that day. And I had wrote him off. I said that was a waste of my time. I'd already fell on that mountain, nearly went off the cliff because of my backpack. I was done. If I'd ever sold on concrete, that was the time. We don't need to worry about the results, people. We just need to be scattering the seeds. That was a bystander. It wasn't even the group that I was looking at. And he prayed to receive Jesus Christ. One more, other, one more person I'd like to share with you real quickly before we continue. Her name, we will call T. I met her back last February when I became a chaplain with Summit Hospice and Waterford Hospice. She had been on hospice for seven years. Never heard of. Most of the patients that I get in hospice... Some of them, if I get to build a relationship with them, are six weeks. If you've ever had, lost a loved one and on hospice, sometimes you know it might be a week that you get to spend with them when they go into hospice care. But this lady had been in hospice for seven years. Uh, and I was warned about her. I said, she ain't going to like you. They said, she ain't going to like you. She don't like no preachers. But she wants a chaplain to come just to give her some chocolate cupcakes every now and then. So you can keep your message of Jesus to yourself because she, 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 she ain't going to be good. That's what the nurses told me. And they said, she'll cuss you out. Like, Here I go. What am I going to do with a woman like that? I go into the nursing facility where she's at. I walk into her room. First thing I walk into, tap, lightly tap on the door and walk in, and she says, excuse me, who are you? And I said, well, I'm your chaplain. And she said, do you make it a habit of walking in on a woman when she's laying in her nightgown? I knew my hands were full with this lady already. So I talked to her. I don't, I don't share Jesus with her at that time. I go to the dollar store the next week when I'm supposed to go back and visit her, and I buy her three boxes of chocolate cream-filled cupcakes. I walked in. I got on her good side for a minute. And I sat down with her, and she opens up this cupcake, and she's eating it. She said, now, next time you come, I want you to bring me a cigarette. And I said, that ain't happening. This lady was just, she's just being authentic. We talked. If there was ever 
concrete I sold on. That's another one I thought I just. She told me the first, when I brought those cupcakes, well, this, this goes a long way, but I still don't like you. I'm like, why? No preacher has ever done good for me in my life. You're wasting your time if you Bible thump at me. You're wasting your time if you open that book at me. I don't want what you're selling. That's what she told me. You know, part of me wanted to, all right. Because we have the ability, if we feel like they don't want our service or need our service, we can just sign a document. I can go about my business. I can leave her be, pray for her, encourage her, but I ain't got to spend my time with her if she don't want what I have that I could help her with. And I thought about that. I, I, I was like, God, this, this lady is so full of the devil. If there was a woman that if I was to put a, build a movie and I needed someone to cast as a witch, that was her. It's, it's just awful. Rude. And I was just thinking to myself, I ain't got the time. And I shared this with my wife. Well, I go back again. And I sit there. And I, I said, okay, I'm not going to preach at you. I didn't even bring my Bible today. I ain't going to share the gospel with you. I ain't going to say nothing. But I want to tell me, why are you so mad? What do you have against preachers? What do you have against God? Anyway, she starts sharing some things. And I knew a way then to pray for her. She had a lot of stuff. She had a lot of guilt in her that was perpetuated on her. Her father abused her sexually as a kid growing up. She had a lot of stuff that was tucked down deep, a lot of anger, a lot of emotion. And I spent six months, week in and week out. I only had to see her one time a month, but I went every, every week. Sometimes I went two, three times a week. Just letting that lady pour this stuff out to me. And it came a place where I got an open door. And I shared the gospel with her. And she broke. She was able to forgive, though she would not be able to forget. She was able to forgive her father. She was able to come to a terms where she had a relationship with who she called her dude. That's what she called Jesus. But I could tell in her spirit, she had changed. I was about to write her off. There wasn't a problem with the seed. There wasn't a problem, I hoped, with the sower. The problem was the soil. I wrote her off. If I did, if I wouldn't have went back, and I wouldn't have got that opportunity, I wouldn't have had one of the greatest blessings in my life. She's died and went to be with the Lord now. Um, about two weeks after she really just gave it all to the Lord, I went up, I got a phone call that she, she wasn't doing that well. And I went and saw her. I got missed a call, so I was running late, but I finally got there. Um, a guy was in there, and I was like, well, what's wrong? He said, she, she's breathing, and she's got her eyes open, but she's not communicating. She's barely hanging on. I got to go to that lady. I placed my hand on her forehead, and I said, the fight's over. You can go be with the Lord. Your heart's ready. And I prayed for her. By the time I got done praying for her, she had breathed her last breath. I wiped her off. I wonder how many times we just write people off. And we say, we've just wasted our time with the gospel. It's failed in their life. It's not done any good purpose in their life. It's failing. It doesn't fail. Jesus doesn't fail. He never fails. He must prevail. And so we need to be about the business of sowing seeds. We need to just be out there sowing seeds. It doesn't just need to be Jesus in this parable. It needs to be all of us. Maybe you're here today and you've been at one time uh, someone that shared your faith. But because of disappointment by people not accepting Jesus, by your interaction with them, or not acknowledging who Jesus is and in your interaction with them, and you've come to the place where you're just tired and giving up. 
You need to stop being tired and giving up. And you need to get that sling going. And you need to start slinging seeds. Don't worry about where they fall. Because the truth is they're going to fall in one of four places. There's not a problem with the seed. The Word of God, there's never been a problem with the Word of God. There's not a problem with the sower. There was no problem with Jesus. And if he's in us, then there's no problem in us. The problem is in the soil. Look with me at the soil. There's four types of soil, four responses to the seed that was planted. The first one is found in verse 18. It says, so, when, so listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. Now, you go to Israel, and I said they got many layers of their, their farming. And uh, one part of it is the path. Path that they've walked. They've cleared, cleared a path to be able to walk. And this sower, when he's just throwing seeds, some of it's going to land on that path. And some of it, because it is so hardened, that path has been so tramped on, when it lands, feet are going to step on that seed, and uh, whatever's left, the birds are going to snatch it away. Now, my wife asked me last night when I was talking to her about birds, she's like, you ain't going to use that bird illustration today, are you? I'm like, well, I might. Do you know that the devil attends worship service? He does. And if he doesn't attend, he sends the emissary. I like to call them the dirty birds of the the devil. And these birds go around trying to snatch away the truth of God's word. And there's some of you today that that's happening to. Some of you sitting right there where you're at, I could ask you what I said two minutes ago and you can't regurgitate a single word because you're thinking about the football game that might be on TV. It ain't important. You're thinking about going to Tamales and wondering if you go beat the rest of the church crowd over there. That ain't important. Or you might be thinking about school tomorrow. Your kid's going to school tomorrow, hoping tonight it says we might have some winter precipitation, praying to God that that don't happen so you don't have to keep the kids at home for another day, send them home to school. Ooh, I almost did that. My wife laughing to me. I did that the first time I preached at a spire. I knocked over a whole candle. Uh, I like this. Uh, Anyway, it landed on the wayside. That's hardened ground, hardened soil. That is a hard heart. That is a hard heart. So some of you are out there, you're being distracted by everything, but not paying attention to what's being shared today. There's some people in here whose hearts are hardened. Some of the hardest hearts that I've ever come to know are in the Baptist church. That's a popular tidbit. So, we had this one ground, this wayside. It's trampled on. And Satan's going around by what truth is left. And he's trying to snatch it away from you. He's trying to steal it from you this morning. So there's one heart that's hardened. And it is a heart or a soil, which is the heart, that has no reception. It can't receive the seed. It isn't ready. It's hard. It's too hard. It's too dark. It's too cold. I like to illustrate it like this. You ever wandered through the woods and seen a stump that had been burned before, but it didn't burn all the way up? Uh, I learned... A couple weeks ago, and I didn't know this, that uh, uh, one of my uh, fellow staff members had burned some pine in his fireplace. That wasn't too smart. And I I was like, what would you get it? And I I was talking about what had happened, and his chimney caught on fire. I didn't know that would happen. But did you know that you can take a pine tree, and when you cut it, that sap will just ooze out? So imagine you walk in the woods and you come across a place where they've cleared some underbrush and they, there's a pine tree there and maybe they sawed it down and all's left of the stump and that, after a while that sap just started seeping out of it and they set that underbrush on fire and it gets to that <coughs> it gets to that stump and because of that sap it just engulfs in flames and it's bright and it's on fire well after a while it's charred it's 
Suppose some time goes by and that underbrush grows up again and you set it on fire. If it's hot enough, that stump might flicker. Might, might get a little fire to it. Might flicker. But give it long enough because it's charred enough. That fire gets to it, it'll skip right on past it. I've got some wood in our outside where we got a burn pile, and every time we light a fire, I'll pick up them sticks and I'll put it down there, and it just gets blacker and blacker and blacker, and it don't, no matter what I do, I can't get the rest of that wood to catch on fire because it's already been charred. That's the same way with a heart. A heart that has heard the gospel time and time and time and time again, but has failed to respond to the truthfulness of God's word every time that heart just gets more callous, more seared, more charred, and it becomes harder and harder and harder to receive that truth. So if you've got any inkling in you today to respond to God's message, don't waste your time. Don't, don't, don't pass it by. Because today might be the only last opportunity you get. So there's one soil. It's a, it's a soil of no reception. The other soil is a soil of no root. Look at, uh, uh, look at verse 20. And then the one sown on rocky ground, that is the one who hears the word immediately and receives it with joy, but he has no root and, is short, and it is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, because of the word, immediately... He falls away. This is the soil that has no root. Now, in Israel, there is a lot of limestone. Okay? And it's not, when it talks about this, uh, th when he's talking about this rocky soil, he's not talking about uh, land that has been plowed up and has some rocks in it. No, those would have been taken out. You're not going to plow up a field and see some stones in it. You're going to get rid of them because they're going to cause a hindrance to your garden. No, he's talking about that that looks fertile, that looks good. Because it is on this limestone, so maybe, and it's not detectable by the plow, so you might have 8, 10, 12 inches of good fertile soil, but then out underneath it is some big limestone. And what happens when they sow their seeds into this ground, oh, it springs up a vine. And it grows lavishly. It grows quick. It is green. It looks good for the taking. But then, for lack of moisture, for lack of depthness of its root, because it gets to that stone and it can't penetrate that stone, can't go any further, whenever the sun is bright, whenever it's hot, it's scorched, and it withers away. That's the soil of a heart that has no root. Oh, for emotion, they, uh, they may be uh, at a place where they accept the Lord. They accept the joy of the gospel and what it has to present. This is the one, look, mind you, that uh, this is the one who hears in the word and immediately receives it for joy. I've known a lot of people in life that have made emotional decisions to follow after Jesus. Salvation doesn't occur in the emotion. It occurs in the spirit. But there's many that will come and make a, an emotional decision. I've seen it, and I've seen it in time again. That's why I don't get all worked up when people might say amen or hallelujah in the church. Because it's, sometimes it's just that. It's just emotion. God may, be, may not be making a difference in their minds, in their hearts, or in their lives, just because of something cool or popular you may have said or the preacher may have said may, a, uh, may an emotion spring forth. And that's exactly what has happened to these people whose, whose the word has fallen on the ground with no root. It's happened. They've got excited. They may have come forward. They may have made a decision to follow after Christ. But then... Something happens. Maybe someone in the church says something off color to them. Maybe it's mean to them. See if they stick around. Maybe the doctor tells them 
there's a bad situation in their life. They have a health issue that they're not going to be able to help them survive. Maybe they lose a job. Something happens to them in the world. And that excitement that they had, it's gone. And if there's no root in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's all that they had was an emotional experience, they're right back looking no different than the one whose heart had no reception. So we have the soil that had no reception, then we have the soil that has no root, then there's a third soil. It's a soil with no room. Look at what he's, look at this next verse, uh, verse 22. Um, now, the one sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and this deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Sometimes the seed is scattered to a person who is just caught up in the world, who's not ready. There's no room for the gospel in their life. And it's thrown and thorns take over. You know what a thorn is? It's a sign of the fall of man. It's a representation of the fall. It's part of the curse. Hey, man, you can, you can plow a field if you've got a field, and you can get rid of thorny bushes, and you can, you can cut up weeds and get rid of that, and you can have what it looks to uh, look like a perfect black, soily place to plant your crops. But, man, if you do not eradicate those weeds, if you do not spray for them, if you just cut them down, man, you've caused a problem. Because them seeds and them vines underneath the ground, they, they, they spread. And that's the same way with a person who tries to live this life both for God and for the world. Remember the Bible says you can't serve both man and mamma. You can't serve both God and mamma. You can't live that way. You can't have your cake and eat it too is the popular saying. And so you have these people that in the world that say, oh, uh, I want to trust God. I had a cousin exactly like that said when we were teenagers, we worked together and um, I'd, I'd share Jesus with him. And his response to be would be the same type of response that you might get with someone like this. And he says, Jackie, I, I, I understand what you say you believe and that's all great. And Jesus is... I want to believe this too, but I got a lot of things in life that are coming up. I'm a busy person. One day, when I slow down, I'll go to church and I'll follow after Jesus that you talk about. That is the soil of the heart that has no room for the truth of God's Word. But thank goodness. There is no problem with the seed. There's no problem with the soil. And we can come to find out that the gospel doesn't fail. It's good. It's alive. It's well. Because sometimes that word, that seed, falls on good soil. Look at what he says. In verse 23, But the one sown on good ground... This is the one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Not every seed that we cast will bring a crop. You might cast and you might sow days and days and days. You might find yourself having sowed for years. But you come across that one heart. That one heart that is ready to receive. And that seed falls. And it's planted in their spirit. And you watch it spring up. And you watch salvation come to their life. It'll just help you become a sower even more and more and more. Don't worry about the 
what might seem to be the failed opportunities. The problem's not with the seed, it's not with the word, it's not with the soul, it's with the heart. Now, you might be sitting out there saying, well, my problem all along has just been my heart. It's not my fault. What, what can I do? Well, the Bible says that a heart a fallow ground can be plowed and ready to receive the word. So today, if you hear the gospel, don't harden your heart. But break up the fallow ground as it says in Hosea. Today, receive the seed that the gospel is sharing. Today, receive the hope that comes from Jesus Christ. Don't harden your heart. But break up that fallow ground. A broken and contrite spirit you will not despise, O God. There was one time among several that I was preaching. I was preaching at a church that I was pastoring, and I had, I had invested a lot of time and a lot of energy in putting together these few evangelistic sermons. And um, we had had a community event, and people had came. We'd probably, it was a high attendance Sunday, and we had a lot of people visiting, and I just, I gave my all, and I, I felt like I'd preached with authority that the Spirit was just there. The Holy Spirit was moving across the room. But in some people, you could see still in their faces, it was hard. they were, had a hardened heart. They, they weren't ready to receive it. And when the invitation came, no one responded. And I just left. And I'm so broken in spirit and distraught. And what happened, God? There had been times like that. And I'd share it with Kaylee. Like, I just felt like you know, the Spirit was there. Maybe it fell on deaf ears. I, I don't know what it was. And if you think about that and you have moments of that in your life, it can, it can bring disappointment. That disappointment causes doubt, and then that doubt will cause the despair that the gospel's not working. But then you come across some truth, such as in Ezekiel, verse 3. He tells the prophet, But the house of Israel will not want to listen to you, because they do not want to listen to me. For their whole house of Israel is hard headed and hard hearted. And then, when you look in a verse like chapter 33, verse 33 of the same book in Ezekiel, it says, They hear your words, but they don't obey them. Yet, when all comes true, and it definitely will, when they know that a prophet has been among them. The problem isn't with a sower. It isn't with the seed. It's with the sower. It's with the soil. I pray that your heart is ready today. The gospel is very clear. Jesus came to live a sinless life, to die on the cross, so that we, through faith, might have forgiveness of sins and have eternal life. If you can believe that with a childlike faith, the Bible teaches that if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. That's the gospel. That's the message we need to be out sowing.